Uh, I hope we're live. And uh, we're going to also go live on Instagram. And uh, I'm going to put this here. Do you guys see us? Are you, are you watching? So we are on Instagram and on, on uh, yes, we are live. It's good. It's happening. It's happening. So it's really happening. It's happening, yes. <laughs> Deva will be coming back. She's right next to me. As always. <laughs> she, I think she's on Facebook actually looking at your questions. Uh, or or sending them to me or telling them which ones to answer. But look, I just wanted to say hi. And look, this is something well out of my comfort zone. And I started to wonder why I uh, even thought to do it. But I think when I thought about the reasons, it's not to defend Osho or, or to, uh, you know, in any way, uh, defend anything. That's not what I'm here for. I think the reason I wanted to do it was because of the love that you have all shared with me and the love that I know that you feel for me and Deva through the music and through all our connections that we have and the love that I feel for you um, uh, in return. And I feel that, that is, that's where my responsibility is to you guys to uh, just to sit here and talk to you about my experiences and do my best to shed some light on the whole trip. I mean, it was a trip. It didn't just start in Rajneesh Puram, by the way. It's been, uh, being with Osho was just as much a roller coaster from what I hear in Pune 1. And uh, later on, even after Osho left the body, the teachings never end. It's, it's Rajneesh Puram is one of many things many earthquakes that I had in my, in my, uh, what I call earthquakes. What I mean is really breakthroughs, transformational moments that I had over and over and over and over again, especially in Rajneesh Puram, because it was the fire. We weren't uh, sitting on a mountain, mountain top in the Himalayas. We were in the fire and that's where transformation happens, you know? So uh, that's what I was doing there. And uh, so to shed some light on that, I'll do my best. Deva? Yes. Yes, Deva. She's... So many people are saying, how good you're looking. Thank you. Yeah, well, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. So much. That's another thing that I hadn't mentioned, but I just wanted to say a quick thank you so much for your amazing support. Really, I read every message, every message, and I looked at every name. I thank you so much. Do you want to see my scar? No, don't <laughs> oh, go <God. laughs> Okay, Deva, tell me what to say next. Uh, so far, I haven't seen a question. No questions. So, shall I just keep talking about it? Well, I have a good friend of mine here, actually, also, Parmita. She's in the room with us. And Parmita, we've known each other through music for ages and ages. She's uh, a real music connoisseur, which is why I love her so much, one of the many reasons. And she lived not only in Pune 1, she was at Osho when she was a, a young 17-year-old mountain girl, I guess. And, uh, and she's been with Osho ever since, and she lived all the way through the Raj. So, you know, whatever I might tell you and whatever filters it might have to get through Deva to... Uh, you know, I also have Parmita now, <laughs> who's also going to tell me how it was. Because how she, you got involved with Osho. How I got involved with Osho, okay. What did you learn through your experience? Um, well, you know, let's, let's put that in the context of wild, wild country, you know. I mean, there I was, uh, one of thousands, of thousands, upon thousands, who were actively engaged in what can only be called uh, a huge, mysterious, cosmic happening, you know. It wasn't what any of us thought it was. And that's the life with Osho. When I came to Osho, that's the life with the Guru. It's never what you think it is, you know. 
it's always uh, a play and it's always there to uh, surprise you to all these dramas happen and to me that's what Rosny's poem looked like looked like a drama that played out while I was learning to be who I was who I am and uh, that for me was a huge learning it's as soon as I came into Osho this this um, this conception of master slave just hit the wall you know there was no such thing there's no such thing as master follower nobody was following anyone you know that's the we were there because we wanted to be there we were there and I'm not just talking about Rashi's I'm talking about we were there at Osho's feet we found something that made nonsense if you like it it was just something that we've been looking for and when you find it you have two choices you just like those fishermen did on the lakes of galilee you know you know jesus comes along and they just put down their nets and they went that's that's radical and what did they do they walked into a cult a guy who was going around temples smashing them up and saying hey you can't do this Imagine if we were going around in churches, smashing them up, saying you can't do, you know, it's an, it's an incredible parallel. But the fact is, we dropped everything. That's how it was for me. And I'm sure for Parmita too, and for Deva. There's a moment when you come to the Guru's feet, when you drop everything you think you know, everything, so that you, you've come to a point where you can say quite truthfully to your own self I don't know anything and I'm ready to learn you have to reach that point I don't know anything you know all my ideals all my everything that I'd learned up until that point had stopped making sense everything i had been told was uh, the way to live this is what this is the sixties and seventies. Remember, so we're in a very innocent time. We just discovered drugs. This was totally, absolutely radical. And normal little kids like me and my sixteen, seventeen-year-old, you know, and uh, so the music reflected those experiences. Not everyone took the drugs, but the musicians who did had a way of expressing that. And what and what happened from that sixth is an explosion of creativity and an explosion of consciousness, conscious awakening. We were looking at new values, not the old values. They didn't seem to work. And, um, and then you meet somebody quite by chance. In my case, it's not even the somebody because it's Osho who, and who, who always told us, by the way, that the chair is empty. There's not anyone to worship. It's hard to get that when you're so in love with somebody, even though, you know, that somebody will continue to say, it's not me. It's so difficult to drop that. Deva, how are we doing with questions? You want some more? Then you're doing good. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I'm rambling, but that's, that's basically how I came to Osho. I dropped the lot, and that's the only way to come to a master. If you come with half a foot, in your old life and half a leg in the new life, you probably end up in trouble. You probably end up being very confused and probably resentful towards somebody who promised you a new transformative life and didn't deliver it, you know? You have to come all the way. You can only do it if you come all the way. That's life. And in a way, that's what we were doing on the ranch. We were all the way. I don't blame the people of Antelope one tiny iota, not at all. I can imagine those guys sitting up there, you know, in their little town, just wanting to hang out, just okay, a little community, and that's it. And then suddenly these these weird people, not just weird people, but they wear red clothes and they, they've got all these sexual mores and understandings and uh, ideals and ideologies, and everything is very different. And you don't like that. You don't want that on your doorstep, you know. And uh, so we were, you know, we were thinking we were isolated and there was nobody around. But of course, humans are all over the planet. And the human, 
reaction and responses all over and we were as a as a group of people we were as much as uh, well i say we you have to remember that sheila's group were no more than i guess 20 at the max 20, 25 people. 20 or 25 people so you're talking about 20 or 25 people amongst 5,000. yeah exactly exactly so and that's what the film has problems showing it just somehow makes this uh, it, it feeds this fear that the antelope people had that we are all coming for you we all want you know it, and and actually uh, uh it, it, you know we uh, we were having a, the time of our lives being transformed by being you know me on the truck farm you know and um and and feeling like you're real sincerely uh using work as a meditation it was all about meditation everything osha has ever done is to help us move into meditation that's that's the bottom line as far as i can tell but all his words all the controversy whatever was created was always a device how connected are you to your inner peace how connected to you are you uh, how connected are you to your breath to now this moment now while we're all hanging out together um so i don't I don't defend anything there. It was like a war. It was, suddenly it was like a war, I think. When I saw the movie, it wasn't like that for me, by the way. I was just having an amazing time, an intense time, really intense. We were 16 hours working. No day off. <laughs> no day. No, every day you didn't want to do anything else, but you didn't, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't like, it really, you know, we called it worship because we had to remind ourselves that everything we're doing, and it goes for right now, is about self-awareness and uh, meditation. That's what I call meditation, it's being self-aware, being aware of the room, being aware of your feelings, our, our actions, our everything, you know, like I have no idea what I'm going to say, what I'm talking about, and that part of Osho's teaching is what I like. I like the edge in this way. I, I prefer not to. I thought of some things I wanted to say to you, but it just doesn't stick in the moment. And so so uh, I'm not here to defend Rajni's poem, but I am here to say that when you're with a master, anything can happen. And you can jump out at any time, unless you're in a plane, of course. And then, <laughs> And then you just have to, you know, wait until you get to the airport the other end. You know, we didn't have a respectable guru. We couldn't jump out the plane, you know. You know, it, we had a guru that was like the edge. He was wanting us to come further and further over to the edge, you know. And uh, that's what all the therapy groups were in the early days. He saw a lot of people with a lot of sexual energy. And uh, his concept was, I can help raise this sexual energy. I can help move it up so that these people aren't stuck with it, you know? And that's what we were doing. We were part of a huge tantric experiment. We, we, we weren't there for the same values and reasons that you might think if, you, if you've never been in that situation. It was intense. We were really, really on the edge and we were learning. And through that came this great music. And through that came these great therapy techniques and through that became amazing healing modalities. All, so much sprung from those early days, you know, and uh, vegetarianism, you know, uh, uh, an understanding that uh, there's more to religion than a religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, separation kind of, you know, thing. So we were bl blown wide open with no dogma. So we couldn't say, you know, you, we couldn't lean on anything and say, oh, these people from Antelope are exactly what I'll show is against. We, we didn't have anything like that. We just, you know, the people in, in those areas just responded 
in the way they felt they should, Sheila. And I mean, that's what she obviously feels. You could feels. ask, how did you feel about Sheila? Well, in the, in the start, I liked it. I, I really felt good because, you know, from, from, what, from what I knew, you know, there was no controversy in, until, you know, we started seeing uh, uh, Rajneesh Poram signs with bullet holes in them, you know, and uh, better dead than red stickers and things like that. And uh, so I, 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 I don't like, I'm not scared of confrontation, you know, but uh, it, it, it took some balls to do what she did. And, uh, and for whatever reason, she, she stood out for a while for us. And she was like, I felt like my champion in a way. And I felt like she's not going to take bullshit. She's not going to do that. <laughs> and she's not going to do that. And uh, I don't need to take it either. So this was a kind of a mindset until it flipped. I can remember passing Sheila once on the, uh, what's it called, the main drag there, I just can't remember. The mall. The mall, yeah. <laughs> I can remember passing her and I seen her walk by me and realizing, wow, that's one sannyasin I felt, the only sannyasin I've ever seen who I felt, I couldn't go up and say, hey, can I have a hug? I could, I, it was just something about her that had flipped over and she was not the same as us. You know, down there in the trenches where the work was, she was somewhere else by that point. She, she'd, uh, she'd gone, and um, and she got so caught up. It was sad to see it. It was sad to see the way that how she got caught up. And uh, but you know what? It's it's all about that. It's all about how she perceived herself because that's the gift Osho gave all of us. This was like a monster therapy group, you know. It was like we had the chance to really look at ourselves and see what it meant to be, for me, to be disgraced in front of the eyes of America, that my guru would be put in chains, that we were ridiculed. What about the Rolls Royces? And, uh, yeah, okay, I'll get to the Rolls Royces. <laughs> disgraced. <laughs> 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 now you showed the orange blanket we were trying to, you can see it on, on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the end, it's all about what, what, uh, what the individual actually got from being there, you know. And uh, we got uh, many, many lessons especially one about humility. That was a good one for us to learn, I think, as sannyasins, because we did, in a way, we did feel ourselves somehow uh, as if we'd got, we, we'd got the cake, you know. We were special. We were special, yeah. yeah. And we had to, you know, that was a huge Zen stick for every sannyasin, the thing on the Raj, because it was like, hey, there you go. How perfect do you feel now? You know, how great do you feel now? And there were so many great lessons like that that shook absolutely everything apart from the connection to the guru. There was no question in any moment of my life or any doubt towards Osho. That was a, he gave me a lesson I could have never have done. I could never have, have imagined putting myself in that situation, you know. That was a situation that he created and it, you can say okay i failed because i didn't build a city and didn't build utopia but that was never the point that was never the point it was all all it was was another situation for them to learn how do you learn what are you going to learn now this is real time this is not therapy group this is not sitting with a master at his feet for days and weeks this is uh <laughs> it's just something else, you know, and uh, and and uh, so and 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 Osho was so radical. What the Rolls Royce is? What do you? How can I possibly answer that? If you can ask me that question, I mean, how can I answer? What can I? Uh, what can I say to you that would justify 
having 93 rolls, there's nothing I can say. Just to go for a mile drive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so ridiculous. The only thing, you know what, the only thing that comes to me is that there was some part of Osho who really wanted to help everyone, you know, and he was, because he was a radical guy, I think he, he was trying to reach the people of America, and I think he was just saying, look, where we are is the most consumer-based, abundant place on the planet. How can I get those guys to look up and see me and see what I'm trying to teach them and see if I can help them as a country to actually see what is possible if we live a different way? And, you know, so, you know, his way was like, get me a load of Rolls Royces. They'll make them look up from their lives. That, you know, and eventually, of course, it did, but it was, it was, it was never, it was just perceived as pure kind of, what's the word, uh, you know, like gluttony or, or something, but it was never what it appears to be, and only we knew that because we were in it. So it didn't matter to us. It, none of those things mattered. It was, um, what mattered was the moment to moment, you know, you had two choices, like you say, you could either leave or, or you can consider leaving. And even if you can, would consider leaving, it meant that you had doubts about what was going on. And uh, I mean, those things are interesting because that's where the guru devotee thing gets, it's very shaky in a way, you know, it's like, do, does that mean you're totally open to being uh, hoodwinked or, you know, or that? But you remember most of us were in our 30s by then. We were kids. We knew where we wanted to be. We knew, we knew what was happening in our lives. It wasn't like we were young teenagers or crazy people just wanting some kicks. There were no real kicks going on. There were just incredible flow of energy that you found yourself in with amazing people with like-minded people you know so you were you were feeling good about yourself and you were feeling good about the connection that that you were receiving you were re you you felt like whatever even if even if it's just a device like the Gurdjieff thing go build a you know go and dig a hole in the, in the, in the garden. And then after two days of them digging the hole, Gurdjieff would say, okay, now, great. Now cover it up, put it back. You know, in a way that was all he wanted to do was to give that guy the experience of digging a hole, you know, and really that's a bit like Rajni's pouring. We had the experience I would never have had building a city of, of being part of a huge thing where we felt like this is it. Imagine how many young people would be love that kind of feeling now, where you really feel you're working like all the young people when they come out for the gun control. All those young kids are like really finding ways, like so beautiful to say yes to something and to live in a way that's beyond the values of this world, which is obviously eating itself up, you know, and to look for another way of living while this eating itself up is happening because, you know, whether anyone's going to be able to stop us, we don't know. But for sure, we're eating everything up. So how do you live your life in the light of that? You know, do you, do you, uh, do you step out and say, I'm just going to have an adventure. I've got maybe 50 years left, you know, I'm just going to have an adventure, see what happens. And that's the kind of... You know, that's really... Did you just commit to living to 120? <laughs> yeah. no, that's awesome. What about did you what did you know about the crimes that they were going on? No, not really. Nobody knew until she left. We didn't know. You know, we didn't know. That was pretty. I mean, that, that's what I mean by humility. Suddenly, we were like, "Oh shit!" You know, this is terrible. This is too. What the hell is going on? And then they all disappear, and then. Uh, you know, and then Osho is so fragile, and uh, and then you know, like uh, Niren said in the movie, in the end, it was like, look, the U.S. want Osho out of the country. We would rather like to get him out of the country now. You know, let's let's call it a day. 
and put it down to experience. It's another lesson. And let's do whatever they want so that we can get him out. And that's what we did. They wanted some sort of ridiculous plea bargain. So we said, yes, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. And they wanted a certain amount of money. Okay. Here's the money. Go. And uh, and so he went, you know. We Monique were, was saying that she was taught, we were totally shocked with it. When the, when the crimes came up. Yeah, okay, let me just underline mm. that. We, you know, like Maniko, who was, uh, Maniko is the composer of In the Light of Love, mm -hmm. We Are Hope. Oh, I can't sing very well. Do you want to see my scarf? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Do you want to see Deva? Mm. There she is. <laughs> what have you got another question for us oh i got lots of questions uh -huh. how's um how long were you with the movement i never stopped you know you don't stop being with it you know it's a funny thing a movement it's funny you know what to call oh, was it was it a cult somebody says was it a cult i don't know i don't really know what a cult, a cult is well, you know? no i don't i mean a cult has always got a negative thing right it's like somehow a cult is something that is like a boil on the skin of conventionality or something like that. Is that what a cult is? Well, somebody does want to see their scarf anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie wants to see the scarf. <laughs> who, who does? Natalie wants to okay, see Okay, listen, it. everybody, everybody, close your eyes. Natalie, will you stay with your somebody eyes open? Somebody else also wants to see Okay, come on, close your eyes now if you don't want to see the scarf. <laughs> Natalie, are you there? <laughs> okay, here it comes. Heard my first strip tease <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> there it is, all the way down. Oh, wow! Yeah. Can you believe that? And you guys healed that. You did that for me. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> anyway, Maniko. Maniko's composer. I, I would encourage you to find some of Maniko's albums. They're really great. Beautiful songs and devotional songs. So mature, so ripe, so eloquent. And uh, she's just one of the best we ever had, uh, Maniko. So uh, uh, she also just wanted to say she was on the ranch too. And uh, she, the ranch is English. If it was English, it was the ranch. And uh, uh, she was just saying the same thing. We were horrified. We were horrified. How's, how did you like the sky? Everybody okay. loves it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll interject something about that. So, it's hey, hi, everybody. <laughs> so uh, how I always saw it is it's like now you have a government, you have all these people in power. They're doing terrible things that you don't know about. But you're so far away from them that you don't feel connected to it. But on the ranch, it was much smaller, and it was like a microcosm of society. And it really was the lesson of power mm -hmm. and how power can corrupt people and how people can lose their way with, with that situation. And it happens all the time in our world, but on the ranch it was smaller, and we felt more connected to those people. But in the same way, the people that you know, who are in power can go wrong. And yeah. It's happening everywhere around the world in governments at every moment. I mean, that's that was the thing. It was that we, because we felt we'd done all this therapy, all this work on ourselves, all this meditation, how can people go that far off with all this, all being around Osho? You know, that was, that was something for me to see. You know, it like, it really was a microcosm of the world. Everything was possible. And whether we say that Shilu, Sheila and all her gang or people went wrong again, is that thing of, well, there, you know, when you're talking about a spiritual life, every situation is a possibility to learn more about ourselves, you know, and that's what we had to remind ourselves. It wasn't a utopian city. It was a spiritual adventure it was a spiritual uh undertaking whatever it looked like on the surface underneath it was everybody including sheila had the opportunity to look 
at themselves, you know, and and to uh, and to and and to assess, you know, after being uh, so involved in self exploration for so many years, what am I doing? What is this? Why, you know, why have I been? Why am I disconnected or whatever? All those questions that that you can look at the movie and ask now, why? Those were the questions that I guess they they could have been asking about themselves then. That's what I was doing. That's what we were all doing. And I think they were too. It's like, you know, we we all in this to learn something. And it was a, it was a very fiery fire to be learning something. Have you found another living teacher since then? No, only this one. This is an interesting question where they said, did Sheila like meditation? Oh, somebody said Sheila didn't meditate. That's why she said that something that, like that. Didn't she she said she did, wasn't interested in meditation, yeah. but she really operated out of a place of total devotion and love to Osho. Yeah. And I really picked that up when I watched the, the documentary, too, to really see how even now she just has nothing but love in her heart yeah. for Osho. Yeah. You know, so... That was her motivation. You know, there's one really interesting story about, uh, it, I think it's a Sufi story about um, the master who told his disciples, go and sit in that riverbed and don't move when the river starts, when the tide comes. And uh, he, uh, he, he, uh, he watched as one by one the, the disciples all ran out there was only one who drowned and, and he was making it that this is the this is the the ultimate devotion you know he died in deep devotion you know so you see what i mean we're in such a radical area that we're talking about things like this and uh at the same time we would you know we had niren who was just wanting to be a cowboy on the ranch you know and uh, like all of us, we just wanted to uh, participate and contribute. But, uh, you know, he found himself um, having to deal with stuff that was amazing for him because he could absorb it as a spiritual being that he is. So he had this great balance between living in the world and dealing with all that and actually finding a space within himself that was at peace, real peace. And I think that's what I felt with Sheila. And, and most of the people, there wasn't that sense. There was a, a, a different sense of reality. It, it came more brittle. It was more sharp. It was more brittle. And uh, that was the sannyasa that I realized I couldn't hug. And That came on so slowly. Yeah. It came slowly. We were all... Sorry, then. No, it's good. I, I, <laughs> I just thought maybe I'd also share a little bit how... how um, because I was also there, actually, just not as long as my 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was only 14, 15 years old. And I, I was there for three weeks for summer holidays and got to work 16 hours a day. It was just so blissful to get up at 6 a.m., wait for the yellow school bus and it's rattling and, and and uh, we're all sitting in it, all ready to go to the truck farm to work in the greenhouse. Often we would sing, just, you know, go in there. And no money involved, of course, you know, we didn't. This was really just because we wanted to, we just wanted to contribute. And, and it was just so beautiful to be in an environment where you know that everybody that's around you is on the same page as you and, and, uh, and has the more or less... <laughs> more or less the same values. Of course, I, I had no um, contact to the to Sheila, to that to that uh, kind of organization thing. But but in Germany, I would get you know sometimes we get the new news and see how Sheila would be in the in the news and how she would talk, and I would cringe and I thought, oh my god, this is not right. This is like and uh, and and I always saw it. You know, this is one person who is very strangely not representing what I feel this is all about, which is love, compassion, joy, meditation, being in the moment, you know, living life fully, which is another question for you, how you, your advice on how to live life fully. So um, 
I was I feel I felt very blessed that I got to be there and, and experience it. And uh, and it like Ten said, I also felt it was a really great humbling experience that we all needed because there was an insular feeling around us being, you know, like having only friends that are sannyasins and, and this kind of dividing thing. It just you know, just and I think it's so healthy that that all dropped and uh, we dropped, and Osha said you dropped the red. I actually wore red and mala for seven years. I just loved it so much, but then it was very interesting to drop it and just melt into the crowd, you know, be invisible and and to experience that and let all those barriers go. So um, that's my little story. And I'm back to you. Um, there's something you said there that I thought was really relevant. I can't, I can't remember what it was now. No, no. Um. <sighs> Somebody says I was nine years old there. <clears throat> One more question. Somebody asked you how to live life fully. Go, get get out, get out more. <laughs> <laughs> Just get out more. There's such a big world still, so much to experience. Was your experience all positive? That's I never that's had right. one moment's doubt, so yeah, it was all positive. It was all positive. I think that was my point. It was like the Osho in the end. I think when I looked at the movie at the end, the final thing, what came to me was everybody should, you know, it's almost, it was almost like a kind of a... a, a a drama or something at, at the end, you know, like everybody's either side of the stage and clapping as the main stars come down the the thing and, and, and take their bow, you know. And I think that when I looked at all the antelope people at the end, I felt so happy for them. They won their battle. They they had a battle and they won it and they were really happy. And uh, and that you know they they felt they were right and they won the war, you know. And and Osho made all those people happy. He put he created that so that they could feel that, you know, because they would never have felt that. If we hadn't have come, they would never have be feeling that feeling of self respect and they did it and they were so happy you could feel like, yeah. And so everybody was happy. The antelope people were happy, the sannyasins are still happy. <laughs> we're still <laughs> running around singing and meditating and and doing our thing, you know. So it was just a, a fantastic uh, f m moment in everybody's life, you know. And if you look at it as the makers of the movie obviously did, as uh, a kind of a fairy story, then you can see the goodies and the baddies and the whole thing, and the goodies one, and oh, the other goodies one too, in a way, you know, uh, because, you know, we wouldn't have wanted to be out on that ranch 24-7, None of us wanted that, really, you know. <laughs> did we? <laughs> Maybe. We thought we would. Maybe we did, yeah. Maybe we did. But, you know, if it had happened, then I wouldn't have met Deva and we wouldn't be sitting here and we wouldn't have been playing all this music. I'd have just been picking carrots for the next 50 years, and uh, mm -hmm. which is also not a bad thing. So... Um, um, some some people are asking about if you could talk more about Osho's passing. Passing? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I have a very special story about Osho's passing. I guess the question is about whether he was, whether, you know, because there was, he was insinuated that drag, maybe yeah. he was, did he take his own life? Oh, that, well, I don't know. The, the, thing, the, the, the thing that I always understood was that uh, as you see in the movie, they they took Osho and flew him around America for six days uh, and took him away from his doctor and his caretaker, put him in handcuffs. Remember, this is a guy that never held a gun in his life. And, um, uh, and then took him to various city jails on the way, rather than just flying for a few hours back to where, he, where they were taking him. And he said... He said, I mean, it's always interesting to quote your guru because, you know, what do we really understand of what they say? But I heard him say that that's when the U.S. government poisoned him. 
and within he he was pretty sure that they were poisoning him uh, on that tour those six days and then i think within two years of that his teeth were all falling out he was he he'd lost a lot of weight he was he was dead he was almost you know two years after he was that. only 58 <laughs> you know and uh, so he always put it down to the u.s government and uh, you know knowing what we also know about governments now and you know and other other situations it sounds sounds pretty true to me he was a very strong man in a way but he was very weak at the end and i remember the last time i ever saw him he was so weak his uh, caretaker anando had to jump up on the on the podium and take his arm and help him because he would still want to come and sit with us for 10 15 20 minutes uh, in silence so we could just sit with him and um, and then he would uh, when he was ready he would get up to leave and this particular night he was so shaky and we were all with our hearts in our mouth just watching him leave the podium with his arm being held by uh, Anando and um, and I remember having a conscious thought at that moment when I realized that the 2,000 people in that meditation hall, everybody's eyes were on that person. And uh, it was there was just so much love beaming towards that person. And I realized consciously, until Osho leaves his body, we will forever be like children on a mother's breast. We couldn't let go. We couldn't let go. And that was the last time I saw him. I think the day after that, I was uh, ready to play for him. I was going to play for him. It was my first time of playing for him since I'd been back. I'd been back about two weeks. And it took me that long to arrive that time because of, I was also going through some emotional stuff with my girlfriend and everything. So I wasn't very present when I first arrived at the ashram. I arrived January the 6th and uh, January the 19th was the day that I told uh, Miller Rapo, who was looking after the music then, that I was ready to play. So January the 19th, that day, the fateful day, Miller Rapo told me, come and play your, your song, Whisper in a Hurricane. Let's play that for Osho. And uh, so I was down there with the musicians waiting from my moment so I could sing to Osho again and uh, be back and connected. And, the, and Rito, uh, 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 Osho's doctor, came to the microphone and I saw him coming and I was praying that he wasn't going to say Osho is not well enough to come out tonight. And what he did say was that uh, Osho had left his body that afternoon. And uh, that was a moment that I will never forget. There was the sound of the whole uh, meditation room went from howling to, uh, it was every sound you can possibly imagine. This was the moment when the master leaves the body is the moment. And I remember laying back with my arms open and even with the conscious thought, pretend if you don't let us now, you'll never let him in. And I felt like I was laying back with all this white light pouring into me from from the lights and the people and the, it was just an incredible moment and uh, it, while I was in that reverie of just receiving Osho because that that's the moment when the Guru's energy is released out into the universe and the lovers and the devotees are most likely to be able to receive it and at that moment somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said come on let's go and get your guitar and we started to play this Sufi chant carry me away la ila ila and uh we we just rocked we just everybody just sang in, in totality and we played with totality and with tears and laughter and intensity and then out they come with osho's body and the body comes through the hall right the way past us musicians and i watched osho his body being taken away I'm watching as he went past me and realizing there's nobody there. Nobody was ever there. And we took his body down to the Gats with the musicians following it. And uh, we walked through the Indian streets. And uh, 
we took him to the to the river to the burning ghats and we we burnt the body and we sang and we cried and we laughed and we sang all night and the next day we brought his ashes back and uh, ever since that moment every devotee instead of looking out towards the master and all that love that went out towards the master is now contained within our own individual realities so it was the greatest gift that the master can give by leaving his body because all that love it doesn't go anywhere it's got nowhere to go so uh, we end up living in love every moment every step of the way. did Osho father any children no <laughs> he didn't he never did he wasn't like that he didn't really there was never a, a whole sexual uh, questions around Osho and I never heard any, any I never heard any girl any woman say to me personally that she had any sexual relationship with Osho. I think he must have had something at some point because he was so understanding of energy and Tantra. But uh, I don't really even care to think about where we got that kind of information. But it was so... When Osho spoke about Tantra, you were in the presence of a Tantra master. When Osho spoke about Zen, you were in the presence of a Zen master. When Osho spoke about Sufism, you were in this presence of a Sufi master. And this was not play acting, this was energy, full on, full on. And uh, it was an incredible to be around that kind of uh, energy, you know, because where else would you get that? You know, it, it was, it was, a, it was, a, I mean, you know, every guru has their own method, their own way. And Osho was, was like that. It was, he was very articulate and very informed. I'll, I'll just clarify something because I just mm. read online that Amrito mm -hmm. responded to that question about how did Osho pass, and he said that it was his heart heart was giving out, and that he asked him if he wanted to get treatment to try to stop that, and Osho said no. He just was ready to let go. Oh, okay. So that that was clarified to me just oh, okay. recently. Oh, that's yeah. Wow. That's there you go. Amrito is Osho's uh, physician who was also who the was, one that was that was also poisoned. Attack. Oh yeah, the one that had the, the needle in his bum. Uh oh yeah. Yeah. Um shall we do this more often? How long were you actually at the ranch? Somebody's asking. Oh, on and off, months and months. I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know. We used to go. I was in the Medina commune in the UK, and when the ranch first began, and then we got sent over there, months, few months at a time, that kind of thing. So it just happened uh, that my the last time I was over there was right at the end of the whole thing. So I happened to be there. Uh, through more or less the whole, the ending part of the movie when it all started to Shin and Shilu and Shilu, uh, Sheila, sorry. I was there before she left and uh, and then I was there for that whole thing. I was just really, that was uh, one of the reasons that I was there at that point was people who looked after the music wanted me to contribute to the music. Uh, that was one of the reasons that I was sent there, but I never really got into it. I, I played a little, and uh, it was uh, it was different music by that time. There was a lot of cathartic music happening. There was a lot of beautiful music too, songs, but in the satsang celebrations, quite often the music was really quite painful for me to hear, and it was it was uh, uh, it was a reflection of of how we felt in a way and some part of something was happening there that made the music uh, discordant and uh, was, yeah, all these things were happening in real life, real time, you know, it was incredible. It was not that everything was right, there was no right and wrong, that was why we, when you look at the movie you know, like there's, there's a, a sense, I think the movie people wanted to make a sense of right and wrong. If they showed any banners of the movie, they're always quite often 
looked, made Osho look sinister and his eyes were open and it could be hypnotizing people. It was, they wanted that kind of angle. They were coming from there. But I read one interview and they, they felt like nice guys, you know, they felt like they were saying that, um, 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 Well, um, they had some footage of uh, a day in the life of a sannyasin, just a regular guy on the ranch. And they said in the interview, this, it was great footage, you know, but it just didn't fit with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, with, with the kind of mood of the piece. Nobody was really wanting to, to know what I was doing or Palmita. It was just the story of these people who were creating a situation. That was the movie. And uh, so I just, that's really important. I think that, you know, you don't, you know, you, you, you don't kind of tie Osho with the same brush, you know, uh, or, 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 or generalize. I think it's easy if we generalize uh, and then we miss the details. And there were so many details. Somebody is saying that uh, he had a hard time digesting some of Osho's actions in the end. Yeah. How he turned against Sheila and called yeah. his followers to attack her. How do you reconcile his actions towards Sheila in the end? Yeah. We can't defend. <laughs> cannot speak for the master. I yeah. honestly cannot. I cannot. If you ask me uh, right now, when I looked at that movie and I saw that, I was like, whoa, fool, that's intense. You know. But to ask me to go beyond that, I can't, you know, it's just that, what do you want me to say? If I, if I was like, oh, at that moment, I realized he was a charlatan and I had to get out, you know, but I didn't and I couldn't because what was happening for me was more than I'd ever had. So who was I to judge Osho? I, 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 I didn't, uh, I didn't, all I could judge was my own response. And if my response was to leave, I would have left. My response was, this is the best time of your life. This is the most intense time of your life. It's the most, uh, excuse the word, amazing time of your life. And uh, you're here to live and die. This is not, that's what I say about our music, me and Deva. It's not entertainment. We're not here to make a show for anyone. It's real. It's real. It's life and death. These mantras, this music, we're going to live and die with this music. It's not something that I'm going to go on holiday from. It's not what it is. You know, so it's not about how long have you been. Once you're in it, that's it. That's it. How many lifetimes, we don't know. But I came home. I really came home. And, and, uh, and I met my soulmate. I met my music partner, I met all my soulmates, you know. So uh, how am I going to judge Osho going, Sheila, is it? I just, I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. Did you see yourself in the movie somewhere? No, I didn't. I didn't. I saw a few friends, though. Mm -hmm. I saw Manisha. Mm -hmm. And I saw Nidhi. Mm -hmm. Nidhi was listening. Nidhi was there. For all you guys who come to Corfu, mm -hmm. Nidhi was there. And looking very good and handsome with a big long beard, mm -hmm. like mine. She wants me to shave my beard. What do you guys think? Uh, she says it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's kind of almost time to wrap this up. And I just wanted to say that we are soon, like we are in, in Boulder, Colorado now, and we're about to start rehearsing. Everybody's arriving today, the, the band, Joby and Rishi and uh, Manolis, and uh, we're going to rehearse for a week. And uh, it's, it's new because this time the tent is going to... Um, disappear. He's going <laughs> to... I'm not dead yet, but I'm going to disappear. He's not going to be in the same role that he's been in for the last 25 years. We've not... We've not done a concert apart for 25 years, in 25 years, and uh, or at least not I have. 
so it's a big it's a big change and uh, it's it feels right and it feels totally supported and the band is fantastic we've been touring with them already so they're all tuned in and they're all up for the yeah. new experience and then hopefully because somebody asked how your voice was after the uh, after the surgery i think Mitten's going to definitely um share some of the songs during the evening but he won't be in that role of basically leading the the uh, energy of the evening and the music i honestly think this is going to be the most amazing tour i really encourage any all of you don't miss seeing deva in her in her power spot with this beautiful band and just imagine Deva alone with her. I'll be there. I'm going to be sitting with you in the stalls in the audience. I'm going to be with the sound guy. And I'm going to be drinking in this amazing moment of Deva's flowering with the band. It's, it's something we've all wanted to see and longed for for so long and to see this happening before I die, which is really, I said to Deva, look, this is what's going to happen when I die. You, you guys are going to go and make some great music together. And then I realized, I, I want to see this before I die. So I'm very, very, very grateful and happy that that we're going to be able to sit there with Deva and support her while she takes us on an amazing journey with Manoz. By the way, Manoz, if you're here, love you, man. We love you so much. And uh, Manoz is going to be sharing so much of himself on this next tour too. And also the great Joby Baker. These these three are the core. You get Joby, Deva, and Manoz. And then with these great, Rishi, great backup so musicians, Danish Rishi and Spencer Cousins, creating the, the the drama through the music. So we can really we can really drink in these mantras. And everybody's there to support the connection and the participation with the singing and with opening the voice, opening the heart. And uh, these concerts really not to be missed. So I'll see you there and I'll be in the audience with you. And if if uh, if I've got a voice, then I would definitely um, have a voice. come and join I've us. Yeah, there is a voice. <laughs> I want to say thank you to Palmita. She's oh, still thank on. you. Nice to connect with everybody. Mm -hmm. I'll see you at this at the TV table. Yeah, though. great. It's too bad. Really, but you know. <laughs> oh, Tell thank them where we're you. Going. Yes, you guys are so beautiful. All the comments I've been trying to read them all, and just you just are so beautiful. Thank you so much for being in our lives and and uh, showering us. And, and can't wait to share it with you in in one room when we sing and chant together. So beautiful. Yeah. Namaste. Namaste. Hmm. So, let's see how we do this. We're going to end this. That was nice. Thank you, darling. It was so <laughs> nice you were with us. It was really nice. Should we do a tour? Let's do a tour talking about the movie. Talking to